Thanks a lot for the nice introduction. Yes, my name is Andrea Spichtinger. I'm a physicist and working as a data scientist at Syscron. Um, Syscron is the um, digitalization factor. Um, company of Crohn's and Crohn's, though nobody probably heard of that name before, is the world leader in the manufacturing of bottling machines. So our clients are like Coke or like all the bottle bottlers, all the, the whole beverage industry are our clients. And so I want to show you a little bit like how amazing our machines are actually. So I have like three machines for you. The first one is the blower. So you take those preforms, heat them up to about 120 degrees. It has to be real, like, really exactly. And then just to blow in with about 26 bar for a few milliseconds to get a perfectly nice formed bottle. It's like a really amazing technique. It's like really crazy. Or the second thing is like the high speed filler. So we're building fillers which fill about 50,000 bottles an hour. Cans go up to 100,000 cans an hour. That means if you're drinking like an average three bottles a day, those bottles for, a ho for the consumption of a whole year is produced within 80 seconds. So less than two minutes. It's like, it's really, really fast. And the third thing is like my most preferred industry, it's the brewing industry. And so, well, I'm Bavarian, so we have a lot of breweries and we make machines that the yeast feels really perfectly and produces the best beer ever. But those are just like three machines we're producing. We're also like washing bottles, uh, um, labeling them in all the different kinds, um, packing them, six packs, trays, whatever, all the different kinds of machines, um, putting it on pallets, and also we have like storages. That means we have a lot of different machines. And the best thing is like every, the machine is different for every client. Depending on the product, there are different specifics though. So there are none, there are no two machines which are the same in the whole world, which is really cool. But I'm a data scientist. I want to have like sanitized data and whatever. And that's like, no, it doesn't exist. Every machine is different. And additionally, it's that are mechanical machines. So there are mechanical modifications on a daily basis. And once a year or every other year, there's an overhaul. That means you deconstruct the whole machine, change the wear parts and reconstruct it, reassemble it. So you have a new machine afterwards again. And the third thing is we are not running the machines. We're selling the machines. So we have pretty much no data about error cases. And the documentation in our factories are rather bad. Sometimes they write down something with paper and pen if we're lucky, but it's not the best situation for us. So um, how can we still give, um, like, help the maintenance people to do their job better? So, and there the big topic is anomaly detection, because that works also if you don't have much information about the machines. So what is anomaly detection? Like anomaly detection has a lot of different names depending on the field. So it can be like outlier detection, novelty detection, um, deviation detection, exception mining, change deviation, change detection. So there are a lot of different names depending on in which field you are. It's called differently. And the most um, common explanation is anomaly is an observation which deviates so much from other observations as to arouse suspicious that it was generated by a different mechanism. So the data point is different than everything else. And what I personally think is really important from Essling, an anomaly may or may not be harmful. An anomaly is neutral. It's nothing bad, it's nothing good, it's neutral in first place. So now I have like, uh, like some data for you. It's like really not very realistic apartment price to distance to city. So apparently there are just two quarters in that city. It's just a really weird city, but it's just to explain what anomalies are like.
So what are anomalies? In first case, you would say like C1 and C2 that are the normal states. And like X1 and X2 are very clearly anomalies. And those are the, those are point anomalies. That means one measurement is so different that you say that's definitely an anomaly. Then the second batch, which you would probably recognize as anomaly, is this. That means it's a collective anomaly. Every point itself is normal. But as there are like 50 um, different apartments with exactly the same distance and the same price, it's weird. There's something wrong. That's also an anomaly. For C3 and um, X3, those, depending on, you need some knowledge about the city. If the city has a third quarter, which is C3, or a, a road, which is lying more outside, for X3, then those are not anomalies. If there's nothing like that, that are also anomalies. And actually, there's one more anomaly hidden in there, and that's like a contextual anomaly. <clears throat> there's one apartment which is just five square meters big. That's really weird. You wouldn't pay so much for it. So it's important that you always consider also the context of it. Summing it up, like there are different kinds of anomalies. They, if it's an anomaly, they str depends strongly on the goal, and it's often not completely clear, like like those two. And for the algorithms, all the algorithms are based on point anomalies. That means you have to transform the, all the different kinds of anomalies to point anomalies. So either with taking the context into account or doing some feature engineering. These are the different kinds of anomalies. Now, which different setups of anomaly detection are there? It's like in machine learning, in the normal machine learning, there are three different kinds. Supervised, semi-supervised, and unsupervised. Supervised means you have, you have data, and there are error cases in, and they are labeled as error cases. That means you can use the normal machine learning methods, you just have to be careful about the unbalanced classes, because you have a lot of healthy data, so the machine is operating normal, and you have just very, very little um, error cases. The second part is semi-supervised anomaly detection. That means you have data and you know there is no error case in. All the data is healthy. So you know what the healthy state looks like. The third thing is unsupervised. That means you don't know anything. There could be errors in, there could be not. You don't know. Now I have like a one practical example with you for you, and we will then go through the different steps and look at the algorithms and see what it means for this example. It's a filler. So you can see, like, there are the bottles coming in. It's a beer filler. Bottles are coming in, being filled. Bottles are coming out filled and then being closed. So that's a normal setup for us. And there are like motors which drive this big carousel. So there's one motor with a gear and the only measures we have are like, for example, the temperature and the current of this one motor. What could happen here? What could go wrong in terms of maintenance? So like bearings could break off the motor, gear is wearing out, something breaks in the machine or it gets maladjusted, but the machine is still running. The machine is, is running high speed because it has to produce. And the only thing how you can detect that there's something wrong is by, a, by a, um, measuring the current or the temperature. Then like two questions which always help me. Like which external influences do we have here? The fr those are like for at first like the speed. If the machine is standing, you would expect a different current than when it's running full speed. That's pretty clear. And the other thing is like the product. If you're filling a 500 milliliter bottle or a two liter bottle, it should be different. So you always have to take the product into account. Those are like two contexts which have to, has to be added to the feature vector. And the other question is like, which kind of anomalies do you want to detect? what things appear and what are the people actually interested in on site. And what happens here is like we have some error cases which are like progressive changes. That means they're slowly getting worse. 
So the one bearing after the other is breaking part by part. And so it's like a progressive change. It can be that the average is going up, also the amplitude or whatever pattern appears more often. And there are some persistent changes. So something breaks and it doesn't repair itself. It just stays br broken until it gets repaired. That means a pattern appears, which is like step stepwise over time. The third thing is like there are spikes too in the data, but in this case, those don't in there are no indication of an error because that are just when you look at the f physical like electricity, they peak because of induction. That's nothing ha that doesn't have anything to do um, with error cases. It's just like the physical properties of the system. When you have that, you have to think about, okay, I, I'm i interested in those two, but not in this. So you need to do some feature engineering. Um, and this is actually the most important part of the analysis. It's like a machine learning also for a normal detection. This is really essential. But I won't go into detail because there will be like two more talks after the lunch break. So if you're more interested in going those ones. But I very briefly, like either you use a lot of knowledge intuition literature or there are also like packages now, like the most, the biggest one is the HTCSA with more than 7,000 features implemented. So you can th just throw those on the data. For a normal detection, I wouldn't recommend it to you. I would more take like, for example, the catch 22 package, which reduces those 7,000 features to the most 22 essential ones to remove duplicates. Or if you're interested in a native Python code, that would be like tears fresh, for example. What does it mean for us? Like we would either, either use like some intuitive measures here like median because we don't want to have the peaks or like the 99 percentile or measures like that. Or we would use the catch 22 because with 22 dimension, it still works pretty good with 7,000, probably not. Then have, let's have a look on unsupervised um, anomaly detection. So the basic principle of unsupervised anomaly detection is the majority is normal and the minority is an, is an anomaly. That means if you look at the densities here, like all the green dots where the density is high are normal, so the machine is operating like it should, and the red points are anomalies. What are the typical ways how to calculate it? It would be like nearest neighbor measures or density measures, as you can see here, or you would do some clustering. And then you find like K different clusters. And then for every cluster, you look how big is the cluster. And depending on how big and how dense the cluster is, you would say, oh, this cluster is an anomaly or not. And in general, the tricky part of it is always like setting the K, setting all the different parameters because it, the result strongly depends on it. For our case, this is actually not very helpful because we have an error cases of persistent changes. So the machine is changing the state, but it's not a healthy state. So it would just like jump from this cluster into that cluster. So at the beginning, it's perhaps still an anomaly. And over time, the normal state gets an anomaly because it's rare and the, and the wrong, the non-healthy state gets more and more normal. So that's actually nothing really helpful for this kind of maintenance tasks. So I will go on with the uh, semi-supervised normal detection. There you have, you know what the healthy state looks like. And the very basic principle is like you calculate the distance to the healthy state. This can be made with like really distances like the Mahalo Mahalanobis distance. When you're like in an n-dimensional space, this would, this takes the covariance matrix into account or you can model the the surface of this n-dimensional healthy state. Like for example, with a one class support vector machine. So you have this super complex n-dimensional surface, you model that one, and as soon as you're out of that surface, it would be an anomaly. And the further away, the more secure it's an anomaly. 
And the third thing, which is perhaps a bit surprising for some of you, is like using principal component analysis. This is also an anomaly measure. Because what are you doing? You're, you're having the healthiest data, you find new basis functions, and then you throw away some of the new basis functions. And you have a very specific reconstruction error. What happens if an anomaly comes in, which is actually represented by the thrown away basis functions? The reconstruction grows. Reconstruction error grows. So depending on which basis functions you throw away, this is also a way to detect anomalies. So that's actually really, really important. Do not use any dimensional reduction before anomaly detection. The chance that you would just throw away all the anomalies is high. So be careful with that. So what is happening with our example here? It works actually pretty good because you just define the starting point with an expert as healthy. And whenever it changes, no matter if it changes like rapidly or slowly, you will detect that it goes away and that this is like an anomaly. And even the nicest thing here is like if you have a new client, if a new machine or over after an overhaul, you could just define the healthy state again, new. And so you can retrain it really fast. But the tricky thing is like it strongly, strongly depends on the training data. If you don't have the healthy state at the beginning, the model will you show will show you something, but it doesn't have to be make sense. And this is also the very tricky part because we have some cases when, for example, the motor is changed, it's normal that the motor at the moment has to work harder until the lubrification and such works is like you is like uh, um, the same everywhere. So at the beginning, actually, the current is higher. And then over time, it decays to the normal state. And so it's really, really it's the tricky part to define at the right time point with the right experts this healthy state. But in general, it works really good, and we also have it in production in our in our client systems. Then the third thing is like about how to set it productive. We have the thing that our clients, as we're the world leader, our clients are like distributed all over the world. And so internet connection is there, but it doesn't have to be too, too stable. And so what are we doing? We're calculating everything on the edge device. So we're, um, we're having an edge device in at the, at the client, doing all the calculation there. And just if there's an error, this little information, this goes into the cloud. That's not a problem. And then we inform the people on site with it. And if there is a stable internet connection, you can just send the data as a batch up into the cloud. Because for us, it's important to inform the on-site people in real time and not like 24 hours later. And what supports us is like we're using like the AWS Greencross device, which um, is is really comfortable for data scientists to use because you can just package your Python code. So with all the different libraries you need and send it to the, to the edge device. It's just one button you have to press and then it's on the edge device. And also like you save your model as a resource, put it on the device and that's it. And afterwards, just subscribe it to the MQTT topic. For sure, for the data engineers, or like for the engineers who are making it the system like super stable and like multi-tenant and whatever, it's AWS is supporting a lot, but it's still a lot of work. And uh, for those who perhaps have already worked with AWS SageMaker, the models which are already pre-implemented in SageMaker cannot be deployed on the edge device yet. But AWS is like um, publishing a new service like every other week or every other month. So they will probably fix that also soon. So now let us, let's summarize what I've covered the last minutes. So 
Anomalies may or may not be harmful. They are completely neutral. And that's also important to talk to the, like, to tell the users. If an anomaly is thrown, check the machine, but it's not, does not have, it can have different influences. It can be that they just did some maintenance, or it could be that something is broken. Then anomaly depends a lot on the, the inter anomaly interpretation depends a lot on the context. Is it a spike? Is it a progressive change? What do you want to see? If you're looking for spikes, then look for spikes. If you are not interested in the spikes, then just ignore them. And for feature extraction, um, the question which are helping me is like, which external influences do you have and which kind of events should be detected? And for the choice of algorithm, the most important question is like, which setup do you have? Do you have some labels? Do you know what the healthy state is like, or do you know if you, or don't you know anything about it? Then you have to go with unsupervised. And for the model deployment, it's also important to know like when is the inform information needed? Does it have to be in real time, or is it okay to get the information like 24 hours later? So thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for that. Do we have questions from anyone? Oh, we have lots of questions. That's good. <laughs> have meetings where we have lots of questions. Or should we start? You are the nearest. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so, thank you for an, uh, thank you for uh, for the presentation. Um, my interest is uh, regarding reporting back for the in uh, on shop floor uh, engineers. So you detected something, you found that some anomalies uh, through the algorithm, and now it's to tell them back what is the root cause of this anomaly. How did you uh, communicate it back? I mean, what type of algorithms did support you in order to communicate it in a clear way? It doesn't help to tell them, okay, something is going bad, and then <laughs> they just start hunting. It's because uh, right, right now I'm having the same problem right now. Mm. Uh, so how to communicate it? Did you have an experience on that direction? And the, my second question is that how did you communicate? So I played with GS uh, Fresh and mm. uh, algorithms. When you combine, you have multiple sensors. So it's uh, uh, not one, but maybe up to hundreds. Mm. And uh, how do you combine? And, and the, all those combined to a single incident, if it is okay or not. Um, uh, that tells you if anomaly exists or not. So how did you combine or go around this issue? So if you have energy, you have mm. um, speed, you have all these yeah. time sensor data, how did you combine them? Actually, those two questions are like combined for me. <laughs> um, because what we usually do is like we combine the data of um, one part of the co of the machine. So if we have like of this one model, we have the current, the temperature and whatever. So um, we have just those information in the model. And so if I want to tell the operator that something is going weird, I already tell him like, oh, this part is going weird. So this already helps in the communication because it's like you don't say, oh, something in the filler is wrong because that's not really helpful for the operators so they are like yeah thanks um but you can already say like oh in this part of the machine something is weird so please check this in the next maintenance window and this also helps like for the models because it reduces um the amount of features or the amount of um incoming data a lot because like in my case, there are not like 1000 sensors in which describe one part of the machine, but it's like maximum like five or such. And so it's like really reduced because you want to get, give the detail information to the client. So these sensors are to some extent extremely correlated. So energy is correlated with uh, some kind of another sensor. So you cannot really separate them or is it can it work for your case 
Um, if there are some strongly correlated ones, we just like we we take the the one where we expect the most input, like with also with discussing with the mechanical engineers. Um, but it's just like there are not that many that many different. Um, so it's it works pretty good actually. Next question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I found it a very interesting talk, but I had a question about um, particularly the feature extraction. So you were using for models mostly, I think SVMs, and um, if I understand, uh, if I understood correctly, neural nets. But for these models. And especially for the feature extraction, you're a priori assuming a distribution for your data. For example, if I take the logarithm uh, of my data set, let's just say I have one feature. Yeah, it's a log. I'm penalizing everything that's uh, very close to zero. So this will totally skew my metric. And it depends on the metric too, but let's just say we're taking uh, L2. Um, so it seems to me that for, for if we forget the models and just do the feature extraction, we're a priori assuming a distribution. So my question is, for your modeling, uh, are you, when you're looking at the data that, um, is good data in some sense, like you have no anomalies, are you computing the distribution in some way from that and then using that to tune your nearest neighbor's model? Because that also has an a priori assumption on the, uh, on, on the d underlying distribution of your data. Yeah. It always depends on like, um, I so far mainly worked with more of the super the semi-supervised machine learning methods mm -hmm. and there you can for example um, use like you can just go back to the slide um, like a one class support vector machine and then it's already like modeled in the, like you have already the distributions represented in the space because you're having the n-dimensional surface and so it's already included in the model yeah. So for you mean for the SVM specific uh, specifically? Um, for the it's the specific kind of like one class SFM. Yeah. And what's your metric that you're using again for the for the SFM? Just L two essentially. Or using because you're saying you're using mal uh, based distance, and that's essentially radial. It's essentially some. It's a. It's computed for norm normality, an assumption of normality. Yeah. So that's our. That but, seems. Sorry. Yeah, sure. Like Mahalanobis distance is like more on the calculating the Gaussian distribution. Yes. And yeah, actually, our data is mainly distributed Gaussian. Ah, okay. That's so, what I was. Uh, yeah, so, essentially, and, you're assuming yeah, normality. Uh, yeah, and multidimensional exactly. normality. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay, more questions, people? Yep. Thank you. Um, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I actually also worked for a long time in a company for anomaly detection of time series. And, um, I think I was dealing with the same problems. What I wanted to know, um, you didn't talk a, a, at all about your data. I wanted to know what kind of time series they were. Like, for example, how the sensors were like, um, measuring how often and, uh, yeah, just wanted to know that. Um, sure. Um, like, um, we're mainly using the sensors which are already implement, like already built into the machine because every sensor we have to add additionally is just, it's too expensive in the end for the client. Um, so our data is coming over the PLC. So we're like restricted to a resolutions of like maximum 100 milliseconds. So it's like, um, current data and, uh, like all that are all physical measures and they usually uh, depending on it depending on which kind of measure it is like with the re resolution of like 100 milliseconds or like up to one second because temperature is not changing that fast okay uh at least one more question maybe up <laughs> Thank you very much again for the uh, for the nice talk. I have one question about the uh, about the training of your models. So uh, what I'm interested in is that uh, so uh, do you have do you see in any of the uh, of the physical quantities that your your sensor are measuring any sort of uh, um, consistent drift? 
and uh, how your models are coping with that with the drift. I mean, do you retrain your model to uh, uh, detect uh, anomalies with respect to this drift? And then, if you retrain your model, then uh, how they cope with the uh, uh, well with the parameters that are actually not drifting. We usually don't have any like every drift means that the system is changing, and every change of the system is interesting for us. So um, when we have drifts that are actually things we want to detect, but you're definitely right. There are like also changes over the course of the year, like depending on the temperature in the hall. Stuff is changing our time, but we're collecting, um, like, we're trying out at the moment uh, how big the influence actually is. Because in terms of a motor which is, has a temperature usually of about 80 degrees, it doesn't matter that much if it has like 15 degrees or 20 degrees in the hall. It's not that dependent on it. Thank you. Let me get one more question. Oops. Um, but before I say, someone just asked me about slides. I don't know what the, if there's a standard policy here, but at the very least, you can ask Andrea. And I'm sure she'll be happy to send them to you. Sure. Same goes for me in the next talk. Okay. My question is about the sensors you're using for evaluating, and you said you're using what you have. And did you think about analyzing sound? For example, you can take your mobile phone and record the, the machine, and a broken car has a very... Everybody can hear uh, mm -hmm. something is broken. And can you tell about something about uh, what kind of data would is good for this kind of detection and what is uh, more complicated? It's actually a very good question because we're already thought about this too. Because like, what happens for maintenance per people, maintenance staff in the in the factory? The most experienced ones are just sitting on their stair on the chair, just listening. And then just telling the new people like, oh, go to this machine, this and that is broken. So it's like the people on site really hear a lot of stuff. So we already thought about doing it. Um, the, the biggest problem is, um, to have a mic, like it's r pretty expensive to have a microphone, which can go into the factory because it has to fulfill a lot of requirements. And, um, um, so we we're planning to try it out, but we didn't try it out. But I would be interested in your experience, so we could discuss it afterwards. That that will have to be discussion afterwards because we we got to move on. We got like ninety seconds to set up for the next talk. So 